morning, everyone. Uh, good morning. You're very welcome um, here to church this morning. And um, if you're visiting with us, uh, you are especially welcome. Um, I know there are visitors with us today um, for various reasons. Maybe you're visiting a friend or you're visiting with family um, or you're here with the Turpin Connection uh, for Leah's baptism. Uh, whatever your reason for being with us, um, welcome with us in this service. And as we go through um, this time of worship, um, just relax, um, bed in with us and just participate as much as you feel you're able to. We're very relaxed here. You will hear children playing and talking and moving around, and we, we love to hear that because we are part of the covenant family of God, which we'll be thinking about a little bit later. Um, so can we just uh, perhaps stand, and um, I'm going to pray for you, and then I'm going to ask you to turn and greet one another in the name of God, and then we're going to sing together. Okay, let's pray. We come before you, Father God, as your children from many different places, backgrounds, cultures, and experiences, but we come together with the purpose of being with each other to worship you. So, Father, we pray in the name of your Son, Jesus, that you would send your Holy Spirit to be with us, to challenge us, to comfort us, and to warm us up as we worship you. Maybe we haven't been in this place of worship for a while, and maybe we come regularly, but we just ask that you would be with us and know that we are welcome this week. We pray all of this in your name. Let's welcome one another in God's name. Let's say good morning, welcome. And stay standing. Stay standing. We're going to open our worship by singing, and we're going to sing two praises to God based on Psalm 23 and then the Servant King. So let's sing God's praise together. Singing's been really 
really good, but let's keep our voices lifted and worship and praise. From that remain helpless babe Thank you. Now every week in this church as we gather for worship, we have a, a psalm read uh, for us and we read the psalm together. So this week's psalm is psalm number 31. And if you have a Bible, you can find the psalms right in the middle of the Bible. Um, and it was the, considered the songbook of God for God's people. It's right in the center of the Bible. You can navigate your way to psalm number 31 you find it easier you can follow along with the words on the screen and the reading is from verse 19 to verse 24 and Joe's going to read that for us thanks Joe how great is your goodness which you have stored up for those who fear you which you Bestow in the sight of men on those who take refuge in you. In the shelter of your presence, you hide them from the intrigues of men. In your dwelling, you keep them safe from accusing tongues. Praise be to the Lord, for he showed his wonderful love to me. When I was in a besieged city, in my alarm, I said, I am cut off from your sight, yet you heard my cry for mercy when I called to you for help. Love the Lord, all his saints. The Lord preserves the faithful, but the proud he pays back in full. Be strong and take heart, all you who hope in the Lord. Amen. Thanks, Joe. Let's pray together. 
Lord, we thank you for the opportunity that we have to come and worship you as a family. Um, we function like a family here before you, our Father, because some of us are obedient, some of us are rebellious, some of us are near to the family home, some of us like to wander far away and do our own thing. But what we can't deny is your love for us, um, the Father's heart that you have for us, and the fact that there's always a light on, as it were, in your home for those of us who need to come home. We sit here before you as people who can't possibly fully know you, but who can seek to know you through your word and through the teaching of your son, Jesus. But as we sit here, we pray that you would open our ears and soften our hearts that we might receive something from you this morning. We might receive a promise from you. We might receive a word of comfort from you. We might even receive a word of challenge. But that we would be open to receive whatever you might want to give to us and that we might know when it is from you. Just pray that you might speak to us as your word is read and taught, that you might speak to us through the sacrament of communion or of baptism, that you might speak to us through the words of another believer who might have a word in season for us. So prompt us as we engage with each other later today that if there is a, a word or a truth of encouragement, comfort or challenge that we can share with someone else that you would show us and give us the courage to do so. We might have joy. We might have sorrow. We might be feeling anxious or troubled. We might be well and rejoicing in our health. We might be suffering in our bodies. And we might be heavy hearted for people we know. This is the place where we can bring all of those emotions and thoughts. And so we pray that in this time together that you would provide by your spirit to each one of us what we need. Just in the quiet moments we just offer in our own hearts the names of those we want to pray to God for and ask that he might be near them, protect them and comfort them. Forgive us our sin, Lord, the times and the, the places when we have disobeyed you and denied you and walked away from you and acted in our own self-interests and not thought of you. Forgive us for those times and renew a right spirit within us. It would make us want to live for you with joy and in freedom. So go with us in the rest of this time. And we pray these prayers in Jesus' name. We're going to sing another song. This song is called 10,000 Reasons. Really popular song and um, one that we sing here quite a lot. Um, and actually this um, made it into um, the kind of the top 10 of uh, the Christian music charts Ooh, um, a few years ago uh, when it was released and it was sung quite widely. And if you, if you have a Spotify, if you have a Spotify app, you, you run a playlist, maybe a random playlist, very frequently you hear this song popping up in it. I've been in, in shops in Dublin and I've heard this song being played and I don't think people have any idea where it has come from but it somehow found their way on to a playlist because of its popularity. Um, so we're going to sing it. It's a worship song. Um, it's based on Psalm 103 and it reminds us that we have many reasons to sing praise and give thanks to the Lord for all the good things he has done for us. So this singing has been really good. Keep it up. Let's stand together and let's sing this. Bless the Lord, O my soul, 10,000 reasons.
take a seat. Thank you. Okay, well, we're moving now towards the sacrament of baptism. Uh, in the Christian tradition, infant baptism is the subject of much theological discussion and debate. And I know looking out on this sea of faces that you come from a wide variety of Christian traditions. And the primary emphasis here within uh, Lucan Church is that we come with the desire to worship God. Jesus is the Son of God who lived, died, was resurrected and ascended to heaven. That is our primary basis. But we also perform the two sacraments. One is that of Holy Communion and the other one is that of baptism, both of believers on profession of their faith and to the children of believing parents. So you might be sitting there going, well, I have more of a Baptist theology, a credo-Baptist theology, and that's okay. You're accepted in this church. And actually there are elders in this church who hold to that as well. But here within the Presbyterian tradition, um, we also baptize infants. If you're Baptist, you might be wetter, but you're not better. <laughs> we, get our, we get our understanding of baptism from our covenantal reading of Scripture, the the scripture is full of covenants, right from the Old Testament right through to the New. And uh, that's where we get our understanding of baptism. In scripture, a covenant is a sacred agreement, a sacred contract entered into between God and his people, which establishes a relationship of love, grace, and responsibility. God always initiates the contract. He initiates the covenant, and he extends his promises graciously, and graciously means not because we earn it or deserve it. He extends it graciously to us and then invites us to enter into that covenant fully with him. He did this most famously with Abraham, where he uh, laid out his covenant before Abraham. And the sign of the covenant that Abraham would be God's people would be God's person and his family would be God's people. The sign of that was the mark of circumcision, which was placed on every infant child in Abraham's household and all those associated with his household. This was a big, generous, gracious covenant made with Abraham and his people. And the sign of that was circumcision. When you move into the New Testament, Jesus fulfills the covenant promises and instigates baptism the pouring of water or the immersion in water as the sign of the covenant. If you're a believer and you come to faith and you haven't been baptized, then you are sprinkled or poured or immersed in water, signifying the new life that has already begun in you. It doesn't make you a believer, but it is the sign of the new life. And for us, with the children of believing parents, we mark them with the sign. Abraham marked the young boys with a sign, they had no idea what they were getting into. It was on the faith of the parents. The children therefore are brought and the same sign in our tradition is administered to them. But it is a sign and a signpost to something that we hope will happen in their lives in the fullness of time. God this morning is going to instigate through baptism his gracious promise to Leah in the hope that Leah would step into that invitation and own it for herself in the future. We are not making Leah a Christian this morning. Only God by his spirit and grace can do that. But we are folding her into the covenant family of God. I don't know if you're a Man City supporter. Probably most of the Man City supporters aren't here this morning after celebrating last night. But if you're a Man City supporter, are you a Man City supporter? City, yeah? Did you watch the game yesterday? Yeah? 1 0? Just about, almost an equalizer at the last minute. If you're a Man City supporter, maybe you want your son to be a Man City supporter. So you buy them a little Man City kit, you take them to the matches, you teach them the songs, 
Pep is the hero and you teach them about all the legends of the team. But in the fullness of time, that child will make a decision for themselves whether to support Man City or to go down the road and support Man United. Or maybe they'll even decide not to be a fan of football at all. But the hope is that the child would come into the full family um, that, has been that it has been exposed to. So that is what we're seeking to do this morning. So we do that with Leah. Now before I invite Leah and her family up, she's, she's uh, struggling I think with a bit of tiredness at the moment, two weeks in a row. I have a, something that I want to read to Leah, to give to Leah. I'll go to the radio mic here, Tom. I think I'm unmuted, yeah? So, Leah. Actually, maybe Renata. Can you stand with her? Craig, can you come up here? And I'll invite the rest of you in a moment. Tom, you come up here, up to the side. So you can all see Leah's expression. <laughs> Get her used to being up here. Leah, you're too young to understand what I'm saying to you this morning, I think. But I want to proclaim this to you as we bring you before God. Leah, it is a staggering fact to know that God made you. And when he formed you in your mother's womb, he knit you together with love and wonder and delight. He kept you safe in difficult times, and for that we praise him. Leah, God delights in you. God has promised to be your father, he promises to watch over you, to care for you, to provide for you, and to never leave you or forsake you. When you laugh, he's going to laugh with you. And when you cry, he will understand your pain. And when you explore and live the fullness of life, he will share all your excitement. As you grow and develop, your father will take delight in you. He will always show up, and he will never let you down. Leah, the Lord loves you. And I pray that in the course of time, you will grow to know and love him too. You could not make a wiser decision than to choose to follow Jesus. He died on the cross for your sin in order to give you a free and abundant life. The decision to follow him will be seen as foolishness by your friends and everyone else in this world. But for those of us who are being saved, that decision is the wisdom and power of God. So Leah, as a community of believers here in LPC, and as your covenant family, we bless you. And we pray that your life will be full of joy, love, and grace. We thank God for you. And we pray that your family cherishes you. And that your friends prove to be loyal and trustworthy. We also pray that God will guide you through life. And keep you secure in the knowledge that you're his child. And so dearly loved. And this is a letter from me, your pastor, on behalf of this whole congregation. And you can keep this safe. Okay, well, I have a few questions to put to you guys, but I'm going to ask for your godparents to come up. Emma Jane and David, I just want to stand here. And we've got Samuel here as well. Who, what age are you, Samuel? Six, six years ago, I was holding you as a little baby, doing the very same thing, professional times. Okay, questions to you guys. In presenting Leah for baptism, do you profess your faith in God as your creator and father, in Jesus Christ as your Lord and savior, and in the Holy Spirit as your sanctifier and guide? Will you, by God's help, provide a Christian home and bring up Leah in the worship and teaching of the church so that she may come to know the Lord Jesus. And to the congregation, do you affirm this, just say we do. Do you, who now in Christ's name receive this child into the fellowship of LPC, promise with God's help so to order our congregational life and witness that Leah may grow up in the knowledge and love of God and be continuously surrounded by Christian example and influence. Okay, you guys can take the baptismal song. I'm going to take Leah here. She'll come to me. We practiced this earlier. 
Okay. Hello. Yeah. Hey. Good stuff. There we go. All right. Right. Do well. Good. Okay. Leah Alice. Leah Alice Herpin. I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs> Can we sing the ironic this? Samuel, do you want to come with me? done. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this covenant of um, your promise administered in baptism. We thank you for Leah. We ask that you bless her, her brother Samuel, her mom, and her dad, and the whole family. In Jesus' name. Amen. As you can take a seat. Let's give them a little welcome. And they'll be hanging around afterwards, yeah? We have cake as well after. So. Well, someone donated it to us on Friday, but we thought we'd use it today. So please do stay for tea and coffee afterwards and have a chat with these guys and give them a, give Lee in particular a big welcome into the family. Okay, just now we're going to pause and have our offerings and tithes received. If you've come unprepared for this, don't worry. Just pass the plate along without any embarrassment um, or shame. But Brian and uh, Dorothy are gonna wait on you for those, thank you. Just now, Mary, uh, one of our elders, is going to come and lead us in our prayers and prayers for others. Thanks, Mary. Good morning. You're all very welcome here this morning. Um, just, we'll just take a couple of minutes just to be silent before the Lord and I will pray and I really ask the Holy Spirit to come here today and move amongst us so that we hear the words of the Lord and prayers that are not even relevant, that we lift so many issues that are going on here in Ireland and, and the world and issues that, of course, we can't all uh, cover. So let us pray. 
We come into your, Lord, into the present, your presence, Lord, with thanksgiving and worship you with gladness. Thank you, Father God, that you are all-powerful, the creator of the universe, and you alone are our saviour. Lord, strengthen us this morning and surround us with your favour and kindness. We praise and worship you. Whatever we carry here this morning, would you bless us with your peace? We are your people. You are here. We come just as we are with our sicknesses, our fears, our burdens. We reveal our fra fragilities and our inadequacies to you. We ask your blessing, Lord, and care for those who are sick, those who are grieving, the passing of loved ones, anybody who is sitting exams, anybody who is lonely, parents who are distressed or anxious, or grandparents who are distressed or anxious and who worry about family members, or anybody who is struggling financially. Thank you for your love endures forever. Let us always continue to trust God, even when our prayers are not answered. He wants us to take time to him, before him, to hear what he is saying in our circumstances. The Lord goes before us and he will be with us. He will never leave or forsake us. We do not need to be discouraged. We ask you, Lord, to bless Craig and Renata today as they bring their beautiful Leah and beautiful Samuel. I know Samuel wasn't, he already was baptized, but we won't forget you, Samuel. Lord, be with you, Craig and Renata, as they continue to pray for their child. We thank you, Lord, for this sign this morning of new life. We pray that Leah in the future will herself ask you, Jesus, to be Lord of her life. We ask you, Lord, that our parents will discern your will in their children's lives and that this family and the godparents and all the family and this community continue to pray for them beyond today. May they know the love of Jesus, the joy of the Lord, and share his love in challenging times in their lives. Help them to trust you, Lord, and we pray that you, Jesus, be their comfort and strength always. And, you know, it's very important that we thank the Lord for different um, areas of our lives. But I thank you, Father, today that the four indigenous children aged between the age of 1 and 13, 13 who have been missing for 40 days in the Colombian Amazon rainforest following a plane crash in which their mother died were found alive yesterday and flown to Bogota. Lord Jesus, I pray their full recovery. I pray comfort for their lives, for their emotional help, for the grief of the loss of not having their mother. And we pray and we join with Christians all over the world in the prayer of thanksgiving, um, along with all those people in South America, for the miracle of, this, of the children being found alive. We bring before you too the people in Ukraine. Thousands have been displaced because of the flood waters from the dam that's been was blown up. Homes destroyed on top of the war situation that people are facing. We will never cease to call on your name in these circumstances, Lord. We ask that we speak out against, give us strength to speak out against aggression and injustice in so many parts of the world. So many suffering violence hunger and despair. Help us to have generous hearts to those in need and to listen to your voice in all circumstances. We pray for world leaders that hearts will turn to seek to build bridges, de-escalate tensions and that the peace of Christ reigns in so many war-torn countries and famine-stricken lands. O oh God, you will answer me, give ear to me and hear my prayer. Show the wonder of your great love. You will save by your right hand those who take refuge in you. Hide me in the shadow of your wings. When we cry out to the Lord at times in their lives, I pray that even when our prayers are not answered, the silence doesn't mean that you're not there, Lord. 
let us press in, let us trust God. The Lord himself goes before us. He will never leave or forsake us. We don't need to feel discouraged. I pray that each person knows your peace and comfort today, and we ask this in your name, Jesus. Thanks, Mary. Uh, we have what's called a day club. Um, it's a Sunday school for um, the little ones if they're in primary school. Um, so that's going to be um, just starting now. The leaders will go out, and anyone who's from the age of around four uh, thereabouts and, and up can go out and enjoy a program there of teaching and songs and craft. So please do that. And as they move out, we're going to stand and sing together, and we're going to sing What a Friend we have in Jesus. Let's stand, let's all of us stand as the boys and girls leave. seat thank you now if you'd like to take your bible again you can open up at the book of joel which is an old testament prophecy now this is going to be um tricky for anyone who is visiting today and hasn't been here for the, the last few weeks because there's a progression of thought and teaching coming through um this um this story so i'm going to give a little bit of context um, just for those of you who are visiting, so you can kind of catch up with us. Um, now, first, I don't have a Bible here. Could somebody sh- throw out the name, the page number for Jewel? 911912, in the round there, okay? So pick that up. I'm on the radio mic here, Tom, right? So um, I do this most weeks, a uh, recap. Now, I'm gonna not, not going to take too long to do this, okay? Uh, Jewel is a prophet, was a prophet. And he wrote um, this book. And we have this book in our Old Testament. And a prophet was someone who spoke God's words to God's people to warn them about something um, that they were doing that was out of step with, with God's will for their lives. So Joel is speaking to the people and telling them that a locust plague is going to come and invest their land. Okay, now locusts are these horrible insects that eat and and destroy things, that's exactly what happened. They came in like a big black blanket over the land and destroyed everything, right? Came into houses, at doorposts, destroyed trees and the barks of trees, ate up all the crops and all that. And it was a, a form um, and a, a function of something that God was using to say to his people, wake up, okay? So God often 
uses things or sends things in our direction that are difficult to remind us to wake up then. Okay? So that's what this locus fig was. You could, you could extrapolate that out today and say, well, what's the equivalent of a locus fig today? Maybe the coronavirus pandemic? Maybe God used that in a way to, to speak to his people and say, hey, remember me? Wake up to me, come back to me, turn to me. Um, maybe, it, maybe it's a, an illness that you're suffering, and you're, maybe it's a, a bad circumstances in, in your personal life, and you're thinking, why is this happening to me? Why is God not taking this away from me? Maybe God wants to speak to you through that, and that's what was happening with the locust plague. And then Joel's message in the middle of that was, God is saying to you, waken up and turn back to me, come back to me. There's always a door open back to God. There's always a light on in the kitchen of God's house, as it were, where he's wanting you to come back home. And how do we come back home? Well, Joel said, the only way to come back home to God is to rend your heart and not your garments. It's not about outward appearances. That's not what makes us acceptable to God. It's our heart attitude makes us acceptable to God. He wanted his people to say, we're really sorry that we've forgotten you. We're really sorry that we've wandered away from you, that we've done our own thing, that we've neglected you. And he could see that in their heart, that sincerity. And because of that sincerity, he would, he would welcome them back home again. And then he said to them, there's going to be this day of the Lord, this great day of judgment that is coming. Um, and that's a sign of what is to come in the future. So be, be warned and be ready and be prepared for that. And if you come back to me between now and then, I will restore unto you the years that the locust destroyed. So he said to them, if you come back to me, if you come back home, I will give you back everything that you've lost and more. And that's exactly what happened. The, the vine started to grow again and the grass grew and the, the, uh, the people could eat their food and make their sacrifices and live their lives because they came back to God and blessed them. And then we come into chapter 3 this morning. So this is where we're picking up, okay? So as you don't get left behind in this. We come into chapter 3, and I'm calling this sermon the Day of Reckoning. We've had the Day of the Lord and the Second Day of the Lord and the Day of Reckoning. We've had a locust plague. We've had people having to rend their hearts and not their garments. We've had the judgment of God. We've had the nations being called um, into, into judgment. This is a heavy book, okay? It's a heavy book, but it's a reminder of what is to come this day of reckoning that is what is to come. And Joel talks about that in chapter 3. And I'm going to quote a few verses. Rather than reading the text, I'm just going to quote verses as we go through, and you can follow that on. There was a, a man in our congregation a few years ago. Many of you will remember him. Uh, he was called Hasib. Hasib was from Pakistan. And Hasib now lives in another part of Dublin and attends Dundrum Methodist Church. Um, and um, is getting on with his life here in Ireland. But Hasib was... Uh, living in a direct provision center in Clondalkin. And he was here because he was being persecuted for his faith and was being run out of his country. Hasib was a Christian living in Pakistan in a Taliban-run and controlled area. And wh while he was there, he was telling his friends about Jesus. He was sharing his faith. That's what Christians do. And the Taliban, I saw for myself in his file, the Taliban on letter-headed paper wrote him a letter telling him to desist from this activity or he would be run out of town and so would his parents, his family and their house would be taken from him and destroyed. And he felt, I can't be a Christian and not talk about my faith. So he continued to do it and as a result he was pushed out and his family came under threat. He ended up living here. Tough times. Very tough for him. And his family still live back home and we're still in touch with him and support him. And we can, but maybe you've experienced something like that as well, a form of persecution um, or a form of difficult, um, a difficult circumstance in your life. And if you have, you'd be more prepared, like Hasib, you would be more prepared to listen to this message from Joel than most of the rest of us. Uh, because sooner or later, we're all going to face some kind of suffering for our faith in one way or another. And that's what Joel is saying here in chapter 3. He's saying we're all going to suffer in one way or another, so be ready. The day of the Lord is coming. The day of reckoning is coming. So what can this prophetic word contained in chapter 3 this morning from God through Joel teach us today? Because that's really what it's all about, right? Okay, it might be helpful and interesting to get some historical context, but what does this really mean for us today? 
Well, there's five lessons that I want to draw out from this, okay? So you can count them down with me, and then they're roughly the same length of time for each one of them, so you can figure out whether I'm halfway through this address or not, okay? If I'm still on the first one in 20 minutes, tell me, okay? Shouldn't be. First of all, um, there will be a day of reckoning. That is the first thing I have to tell you. I'd like to tell you something different, but I can't. This is what the Bible is teaching us here. If you look at verses 1 and 2 of chapter 3, it says this. In those days and at that time, when I restore the fortunes of Judah and Jerusalem, I will gather all nations and bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat. There I will put them on trial for what they did to my inheritance, my people Israel, because they scattered my people among the nations and divided up my land. So what is happening here? Three things I want to talk about here in this, these first two verses, right? First of all, uh, the, what is being referred to here by God is what they did to my inheritance, my people, okay? So the day of reckoning is God having his day of reckoning because of what other people did to his people. God is being jealous for his people, defend, coming to the defense of his people, arguing for his people, okay? So the day of reckoning, if you are a believer, if you're a follower of Jesus, the day of reckoning is actually a good thing because God, it's God's day of reckoning for those who have caused us harm, okay? So the day of reckoning is not to be feared if you're part of God's community, part of God's family, okay? That's the first thing. My inheritance, my people, it's for us, not against us. Secondly, the day of reckoning is for all nations. Do you see that? I will gather all nations and bring them down into the valley of Jehoshaphat. Do you see that? It's for all nations. So it doesn't matter your background, your culture, your home country, your traditional experience. It doesn't matter whether you're from a Christian country or a country that hasn't had the, the advantage of having heard the Christian message freely. It doesn't matter. All nations are being called down into the, the valley of Jehoshaphat to be put on trial. That's the third thing, is that they will be put on trial, okay? So my inheritance, the day of reckoning is good for us, okay? Good for us, because it's for God defending uh, us. Secondly, all nations, no one can escape it. And thirdly, we will be put on trial. And actually, the valley there, the valley of Jehoshaphat, um, means the place of judgment. So that's where God is calling his people to. So the first thing I want to say to you is that there will be a day of reckoning. Okay? And this picks up the powerful language of chapter 2, verses 30 and 31. That we saw last week where it says, And I will show the wonders in the heavens and on earth, blood and fire and columns of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. So what we're seeing here through that description is the staggering intensity and cosmic scope of the divine activity on that day. Intensity piled upon intensity. All the nations in the valley being judged because God is jealous for you and for me and for what those people may have done for us, okay? The day of the reckoning is coming. That was one. You can count that off on your hand, okay? And we go to the second one, the second thing that we learn here is that there will be justice for God's persecuted people. Hasid, there will be justice for him. The nations will be gathered for judgment, as we have seen from verse 2. And then let's remind ourselves of that verse again, which says, I will gather the nations and bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat. There I will put them on trial for what they did to my inheritance, my people. So the nations are on trial for what they have done to God's people. So there will be justice for God's persecuted people. And then you look at verses 10 and verse 12. It says, beat your plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks into spears. Let the weak say, I am strong. Come quickly, all you nations, and assemble there. Bring down your warriors, O Lord. Let the nations be roused and come to the valley. This is saying that there is going to be Justice for God's persecuted people. One of the resources we rely on quite heavily in LPC is the Church in Chains prayer guide. The Church in Chains prayer guide is, is an account of um, people who are living in 
uh, faraway countries in the world where the governments and the peoples are, are hostile to Christianity. And so the prayer guide um, puts together and spotlights different cases and situations and individuals and countries. And we use it a lot here in our prayers. Um, here's an excerpt from last month's entry on the Church in Chains about persecuted Christians. This is an example of what is happening in other parts of the world. A Vietnamese Christian identified only as Brother Can died recently after being arrested. He was detained for two days and he was tortured in detention. After returning home, he could not eat or drink anything for two days and told family members that he did not think he would live very long. He then pleaded with them to continue to stand firm despite everything they were enduring for their faith. Soon after, Brother Can collapsed and died, leaving behind his wife and two children aged 14 and 8. Voice of the Martyrs Australia, which reported the news, supplied funds to cover the funeral costs. Brother Can was the first convert in one of Viet uh, Vietnam's central highland provinces. He became a Christian around four years ago, then led his family to Christ. And it is reported that in rural regions of Vietnam, a sole convert family in an area with no other Christians is a target for the authorities. So Brother Can came to faith, his family came to faith, he was taken, he was imprisoned, he was beaten and mistreated so badly that he died when he was released, persecuted for his faith. I highly recommend the Church in Chains website for staying updated on church affairs and the broader culture. Um, the website also features a piece on Eritrea in Africa which is described as one of the worst countries in the world for Christian persecution. Conditions in Eritrea, if you're a Christian, are so harsh that people refer to it as Africa's North Korea. And consequently, tens of thousands of Christians have fled Eritrea, and Christians are considered illegal in that country, despite committing no crime other than believing in God. But nonetheless, as the Lord declared through the prophet Joel, there will be justice for God's persecuted people. He will judge the nations for what they have done to my people, my inheritance. Just a reminder at this point that we're having a prayer meeting tonight and its focus is on the persecuted church. Seven o'clock tonight in this space of some worship and time of guided prayer. Um, if you want to pray for the persecuted church, for persecuted Christians, that this day of reckoning might come soon for them, that they might be released from their suffering, and not just released from their suffering, but those who have, have, have caused them to suffer will be held to account for that, then please do come back this evening and join with Dorothy and the prayer team, and let's pray into this, which is quite relevant through this passage today. So first of all, there will be a day of reckoning. Secondly, it will be a day of justice for the persecuted. Thirdly, building on that, there will be payback time for the sins of the nations. Listen again to verses 2 to 8 and hear the catalogue of serious sins that are spelled out um, for which payback is coming. Verses 2 to 8. I will gather all the nations, bring them down into the valley of Jehoshaphat, where I'll enter into judgment with them on behalf of my people. This is because they have scattered them among the nations. See if you can count how many how many things are listed here, okay? Scattered them among the nations, divided up my land, cast lots for my people, traded boys for prostitutes, sold girls for wine and drunk it. What are you to me, O Tyre and Sidon and all the regions of Philistia? Are you paying me back for something? If you're paying me back, I will return your payment on your own head swiftly and speedily. For you have taken my silver and my gold, carried away my rich treasures into your temples, you have sold the people of Judah and Jerusalem to the Greeks in order to remove them far from their own border. Behold, I will stir them up from the place to which you sold them, and I will return your payment on your own head. I will sell your sons and daughters into the hands of the people of Judah, and they will sell them to the Sabians, to a nation far away, for the Lord has spoken. So this gathering of the nations, unavoidable, in the valley of Jehoshaphat, here all the nations who have persecuted God's people are being not only judged for what they have done, but the account of what they have done is being read out publicly. 
So what are these nations guilty of in the last century? Did you count? How many did you get? Five, six? Anyone get more than six? A few more than six? They have scattered God's people, taken their land, treated them with contempt, enriched themselves through slave trading. They have engaged in gross sexual immorality, debauchery. They've used the proceeds of slave trading to treat people like property for a moment of pleasure. They've stolen, they've taken God's treasures, they've defied God's name with their idolatry, and so on and so forth. God is the God and the Lord of all the earth. And although he is slow to anger, as we were singing about earlier, he is not, he is a holy God who justly hates unrighteousness and injustice. And he will not leave it unjudged. One of the TV lockdown hits in recent years is the BBC's The Repair Shop. Um, I don't know if you know it, but many people seem to love it. Smashed up old things of all sorts are restored to their former glory in front of our eyes by expert craftsmen and women. And there are always three stages to the process. Number one, identify what's wrong that needs to be put right. Number two, remove everything um, that is wrong once and for all and bin it. And number three, rebuild and restore. Okay? Identify the problem, remove the problem, and restore. Really, what's happening in the valley of Jehoshaphat is God's repair shop. He identifies what's wrong, this list of sins against him and his people. He wants to remove it, put it in the bin, and then rebuild and restore. Okay, so there will be a day of reckoning. One, there will be justice for the persecuted. Number two, there will be payback for sins committed. Number three, and fourthly, so we're getting near the end, right? Getting there. Fourthly, there is an invitation to decide to turn back. That is always there in Joel. The invitation to turn back, to come home. And this is the day of grace. This is a day for all of us to do that. Multitudes, multitudes, verse 14. In the valley of decision, for the day of the Lord is near. In the valley of decision. The valley of decision. Here we are with an opportunity to make a choice to come home. And this takes us back to chapter 2, specifically verse 32, which we looked at and rested on for a while last week. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So even if you're in the valley of decision, the valley of Jehoshaphat, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem there shall be deliverance as the Lord has said, and among the survivors shall be those whom the Lord calls. Billy Graham, right? Everyone knows who Billy Graham is and was. Big like a global evangelist. Billy Graham used to use this passage and this phrase repeatedly. Now, when I was in London a few years ago, I went into a church, big white church near Spitalfield Market, and there was a an, an, an Asian woman who was kind of on stewarding duty. She was just sitting in the, in the chapel by herself there to greet guests as they come in and provide a bit of information. And she told me in conversation that she sung a solo at one of Billy Graham's crusades in London. And I, was, I kind of thought, I think, perhaps this woman is having a moment. I didn't know whether I fully believed her. Uh, and she must have picked that up from me. And she stood up and started to sing. She had an amazing voice. had no reason not to believe her. And then she went and showed me photographs that she had of the crowds that day whenever she was singing to masses of crowds of people in England's capital city in London before Billy Graham came out to preach. And Billy Graham used to use this phrase repeatedly, speaking about the valley of decision. Here we are gathered today. God, the day of reckoning, we are here together in the valley of decision. Not just that the sins would be judged, but the opportunity is there to come home. To come home. And there's always grace in these passages. There's always hope. There's always light in these dark Old Testament passages. Perhaps if Billy Graham was here instead of me this morning, he would call you out in that particular, in his particular fashion and say, you're all in the valley of decision. You're all in the valley of decision. Will you remain there? Or will you come out of that valley? Will you 
Will you make a choice to follow Jesus, to come back home again into the safety and the security of the presence of God? Which leads me on to my fifth and final point. I can breathe a sigh of relief, okay? Some of you are watching the clock. Finally and fifthly, this passage tells us that God will make his people safe. God will make his people safe. This prophecy from Joel this morning might be for those of you who aren't used to hearing these words, quite somber, maybe even frightening, maybe even dark. Maybe you've come to church the first time in a long time and you think this message hasn't changed much in a, in a number of years. But let's look at the wonderful way that our section ends in verse 16. It says in verse 16, The Lord will roar from Zion and thunder from Jerusalem. The earth and the heavens will tremble. That's in the power that that is communicating. But the Lord will be a refuge for his people, a stronghold for the people of Israel. So in his reckoning, in his judgment, in the valley of decision with all of the nations and all of the sins projected onto the cliff face, and the Lord is roaring like a lion, and thundering from Jerusalem, and the earth and the heavens are trembling, such as this great and mighty day of reckoning. But the Lord will be a refuge for his people, a stronghold for the people of Israel. God promises safety. I don't know if you live a life and you don't feel very safe. Maybe you don't feel safe in work. Maybe you don't feel safe at home. Maybe you just don't feel safe out there in the world for whatever reason, physically, emotionally, psychologically. This place is not often a safe place to live. But God says, even in the midst of the thunder and the roar and the judgment, there is a safe place, and that is under the wing of God. He will be a refuge for his people and a stronghold for the people of Israel. And the same goes for all of us, young and old, in the face of the ravages of everything that we might call sin and everything that that represents, that we know we have this heavenly Father and we can come to him through the crucified and risen Christ and we are safe. He is our refuge our stronghold, and our help. Let me pray for you. Let's pray. Father, we hear nothing else today. Let us know this, that we will stand before you, a holy God, and that if we are in you, part of your family, committed to you by your grace, then we are safe and we are home and we have nothing to fear. But if we are in the valley of decision and we are not sure, uncertain, remind us graciously, as you did through Joel in those days, that a day is coming when the decision we make will be relevant and help us to make the decision for you. Be near us, comfort us, but also challenge us. And we pray this in faith and belief in you and your word. Amen. So we're gonna finish our service and we do that by singing. So we're gonna to stand together and we're gonna sing our last hymn of praise, which is in Christ alone. I hope it's fun. Well,
Please say them with me. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Amen. Please stay for some tea and coffee just through these doors into the back.